So this week, the content is going to be price theory. We're going to be talking about how to use marketing thinking in terms of setting prices, in terms of using price as a marketing tool. Now this may differ a little bit from what you might be used to dealing with in terms of using price as, say, an economic tool or an accounting tool. Price overall plays the role of bringing you the money, and the money lets you continue to operate. So, objectively, your plan is to create an offer that is valued by the market, charge them a price that they find to be a reasonable exchange for the offer, and what it is that you are going to deliver to them, and what they have to expend in order to access that offer. And then you want to make certain that on top of that, that ultimately you are turning a profit, or at least you are covering your costs, or that you are intentionally cross-funding your operation by the use of another profitable venture. For the purposes of your marketing plan, I am not going to expect you to run budgets and calculations to work out break-evens, to do cost-benefit analysis. I believe very strongly that you have those skills already and elsewhere in your course and in your degrees. What I want to show you here is how price functions as a means to communicate to the market, to your competitor, to your consumer, how price can influence consumers on a psychological level, and this is one of the things that a few people were interested in understanding is how does marketing influence the way you think? Price is an area where it's very well documented how little subtle signals in the amount something costs can make a major difference in how people perceive that amount. And finally, pricing also has two aspects that we deal with in marketing. The financial, the money, the what people will incur in terms of dollar, yen, pound, Deutschmark, Bitcoin, or whatever else, and the non-financial. And the non-financial is an area that I'll talk to quite a bit because it's something that lets us influence the worth and perceived worth of our goods. Now, one of the things that you do need to get a separation on right at the top is cost versus price, what it costs us to make versus what we charge the customer are two separate things. So when you're talking price, you're talking about what will they have to incur, the customer, the consumer, the end user, what will they have to incur in order to buy, use, or access the value offer that we are presenting to them. I will also use the term value offer interchangeably with product because I am going to mix both the British definition, the anticipate satisfy at a profit, and the American definition, exchange an offer that has value. So, first thing, knowing the segmentation is something that we really need to continue discussing, continue working on, you can use pricing theory as a basis for segmentation. Now the broad segment options you had, one of the options was the socioeconomic status or the demographic status, where you're looking at people's incomes. Here, what you're able to do is to say, I will pick my market based on either their degree of sensitivity to price or their willingness to pay as are they the kind of customer I want and as the kind of customer I want, are they willing to spend the money required to buy my product? We all have ideal customer types we want and we are all in certain markets ideal customers are we willing to spend the money? Do we want something for free and that to continue being for free? 
and that the value we perceive is not enough to get us to part with cash, but we're willing to part with time. The second block is the ability to actually pay for this, the disposable income. Now there's two parts of the disposable income segment that you can consider. Do people have enough money to basically pay their way and then acquire your products? Or is this a question of can you charge a premium? Can you get people to overpay pay more than the product is worth so that you can have an equal level of cross-subsidization. You'll get a product that is at net cost $10. You charge people who are willing to buy, pay $20 so that you can have other people pay $10, so pay $5 for this $10 product. So you can sell to them at low costs for socioeconomic, societal, or ethical, or other reasons. So you want to be looking at here, can you, in terms of your segments, identify people who we could take a reasonably large amount of money from, and they would be satisfied that they have received a good deal. And the thing that you want to look at in that last aspect, the ability to pay over price, is that this is a psychological benefit. This is a psychological reward. This is where you start having things like the name your own price, the set your own price policies, so that someone who has the money can pay $1,000 for a bundle of software that anyone else could receive for 10. But they are overpaying and they are pleased to have been overpaid and they are actually deliberately seeking to overpay because if they pay a thousand, everyone else gets to pay five, whereas if they paid, say, the five dollars, if they hadn't paid that thousand, there would be a charge of ten dollars or seven dollars. So we're looking at all these different ways, and when we go through price theory, think, is the customer I want to address, how are they going to respond to price, are they the customer I want? If they're the customer I want, what sort of pricing can I do to give them something of value? Because the final consumer side thing you want to be thinking about is there's a lot of psychological elements to pricing that are beyond the rational, calculative, mathematical my per unit costs come out to $150 per item, therefore using a markup percentage I should charge $200 because it cost me $150, I'm making $50 profit, I'm covering my costs, all's good. If the product you are selling has and the product you are targeting has a set of existing prices associated with it. You are going to need to take those factors into consideration. If you are positioning yourself as the quality alternative, the luxury option, so you're coming out into the market with a high grade, high quality, luxurious version of a standard issue product. You're talking about the gold plated iPhone or the diamond encrusted Xbox. You're going to have to charge a premium and a markup that is in several thousand percent markup because otherwise you won't be meeting the expectation of the customer. And a less extreme example if you come across a product where the price is too good to be true or you are used to a price in this particular area of say paying $100 for this particular object and you come across something in the tune of $30 you are going to imply that perhaps this $30 version isn't as good as the $100 one. 
because you're expecting to pay a certain amount too far outside that range and it changes the perception of the quality. The other aspect that we need to consider when we're setting prices is prices must link to your objectives and link to the actual quality of your product. If you are making your product out of recycled cardboard and scavenged parts from a recycling centre, you should be reasonably expected to be down on the mid to low tier price range, unless of course you are claiming that it is an artwork, in which case ramp it up, charge to the roof. You can charge a premium for opening night for exclusivity because people will see the worth in the exclusivity and the exclusivity in the worth. A limited edition run, a limited screening, double A front row seats, things that have premiums because there are very few of them should be charged at premium prices so people feel that they're getting value. To pay $600 to go to an event that anyone else can attend for $50 seems extraordinary. But because it's part of an exclusive that only 10 of these tickets are available, or 20 of these tickets are available, these are the golden passes, you throw in a few extra features, but the exclusivity, the I have what you do not have, it's worth me paying this money. It's the price policy elements. You also find that things like services and service products, haircuts, a $10 haircut has its implied worth in terms of what it would look like and the quality of it versus $250 for a haircut, which would be regarded by many as standard, versus $500 for a haircut. Excessive, no? Finally, now this would be harder for you to do in a marketing plan, but it's something you would consider as a marketer, so this is something you pick up on your training as you go along. The customer's internal reference price. Here, what you want to be thinking about is at what point is something good value, poor value, a bargain, and too cheap. Can't be, can't be good, it's too cheap. These pricing points are held internally. These are mental processing points where we look at them and say, for the same product, we have a price range. What is the worth of a can of soft drink? At a function, it's free. At a football stadium, that's probably not available, but at a football stadium, five bucks. At a vending machine, two bucks. Bought in a pack of 24, 50 cents. The reference prices will also be situation specific, will be context specific. The fact that you will spend, you can pay a higher price for a smaller volume, because that smaller volume object has a certain set of different uses. So in all of this, what you're looking at as a marketer and your marketing plan is how do I be cognizant and aware of it? How do I make use of it? So consider the psychological pricing issues as part of your things to address in the marketing plan. So, let's talk price. First and foremost, there are monetary prices, there are non-monetary prices. Price is inherently the value you exchange in return for the offer. So it can be financial. It can be as simple as money for goods, money for services. We pay you, therefore, we think it's worth an amount of money, we give you that amount of money. That's not the only thing we can do with price. And this, frankly, for me, is where it gets really fun because in my specialist area of social marketing, I spend a lot of time working on products that are either free or have negative price. Where you can't put a financial figure on it, but 
you can put time, effort, energy. Now, I can't put a financial charge on, I can't put a financial price on your marketing plan. You cannot buy a marketing plan off me. You cannot buy the grades in your marketing plan for a cost, for a price. But there will be an exchange of value where you put time, effort, energy, and I will reward you with non-financial rewards. Now, non-monetary prices are really good because these are psychological prices, and these are something that in the marketing mix change the way the product is perceived. So this is a really strong interaction effect. If a product has a high time cost, that changes its perception. I've talked about uh, the game Candy Crush a couple of times in tutorials. It's a Facebook game that's an iPhone game and an Android game that costs you, uh, say, 99 cents a go per component parts, or it costs you time. The wait of 25 minutes for a life to respawn, which you can shortcut by paying money. So there's a clear time price trade. It also costs you effort, energy, mental exertion, frustration, and yes. The thing is, with non-monetary price, is that you can make a product cheaper or more expensive as a feature of that product. One of the things that a lot of uh, marketers sort of fall into the trap of thinking is everything needs to be cheaper, easier, faster. That's not always what the marketer is looking for. If you are looking for a second generation product, you're looking to enhance your product, it may be that you need to make the product slower. Slower, you say? Why would anyone want a slower product? Because the value of time if you can say a home cooked meal, oh, this took me six hours to prepare because I had six hours to spare. Look at me, I've got time luxury. Versus simplicity. We keep believing that we must make things easier. The non financial price of easier can be to take out the feature of complexity that we were selling in the product in the first place. The complaint of this game is too easy. This movie's plot was too straightforward. It was too obvious. Complexity is valued. So let's talk about a couple of issues. One of them is if we're going to get people to use our product, what is it going to cost them to use our product? Now, financial price talks about the cost of acquisition. How much do you have to pay to use this? Adoption costs are the costs of actually consuming and using the product you put out and the offer you've made. We take, for example, dentistry. Better living through modern science. Dental appointment costs you time. You're going to be spending 45 minutes plus travel time to get there. It's going to cost you psychological risks. If you have certain phobias and fears, those will be exacerbated. You still have the whole sense of, have I, is the dentist going to be pleased or unhappy with me? And then you have a physical discomfort because you're basically at a dentist and you're getting dental surgery done, that's not what we would call comfortable. So there's the financial cost, there's the time effort, then there's the daily energy expenditure to engage in the dental hygiene activities to reduce the cost of the dentist down the track. Then there are the psychological elements of you do everything right and your teeth still implode, you still need fillings, but you've done all the right things and the frustration you feel on that. 
Or there's the risks of, I'm going to go see a dentist, maybe go out and find bad things, I have to spend lots of money getting my teeth done. But if you don't go see the dentist, maybe there'll be bad things that I won't find in time. All of these things, all these aspects here need to be considered and consider from what does it cost to buy my product? So when you put this product out in the market, what does it cost to buy? What does it cost to use? And if you're using the SIVA framework, the solution, information, value, access, value and access are critical parts in adoption costs. To get the best out of my product offer, what will it cost someone in terms of money, and time. So to come to university and to study, you have the upfront costs of your student fees, your degree, the fees for your degree, all the books, all the other elements, but then you also have the foregone costs of time and efforts. Then you also have the elements where, okay, you really want, there's a really great article that would be really useful for your assignment, but it's 25 pounds to buy. So you have to start throwing in more cash to access this particular service, to get you know, the best education experience possible. You find yourself buying additional parts, additional things, throwing in extra energy. And despite all that, you worry that maybe at the end, maybe what if you got it wrong? So these are the factors. On your products, what I want to see in a marketing plan is I want to see you addressing this, not necessarily a dot point checklist like that is here, but addressing them in application. So going, okay, <coughs> what is the feature of my product? Is it low time cost, high time cost? Make notes of this in the planning. And also look to see whether in fact people are seeking high time cost or low time cost. A complaint you will hear from a certain product category the video game market is, oh, it was a great game, but it was very short. I only spent 12 hours in the game. Versus the complaint of, I've lost half of my life to World of Warcraft because I've spent too many hours in it. So time costs are something that can either be a feature that you emphasize and say, this will keep you occupied for ages, or it is a cost that you minimise, you try and come up with faster, more efficient ways. Okay, so knowing that we've got psychological price, so we've got the non-financial price and the financial prices. What we're going to talk about a bit here is the price planning. What I need you to be thinking about as you go through this is that you can plan non-financial price as well as you can plan financial price. It's a little bit harder. There are a couple of tricks, but the value in terms of payday for you is magnificent. So the first item on the agenda is going to be setting pricing objectives. Here, what you need to do in your marketing plan is ensure that the objectives you set for your price are consistent with the objectives that you have set for your plan. You have the SMART objectives section. You must ensure consistency between the objectives in the plan. So if your objective is growth, positive growth of 5% over 12 months, this could give you a pricing objective to perhaps discount. Price bundle, all sorts of other options. If, however, your price objective, your uh, smart objective was reduce the overall market share by 25% to reduce the number of people purchasing the product whilst maintaining the average income from the product, reduce the scale, but increase the return per object, then your pricing objectives would have to be raise the price. So let's talk them through step by step. Usually there are 
There's a discussion that takes place in advertising that there are two types of advertising objectives. Sales objectives and things that turn into sales objectives. Here, in marketing, the pricing objectives are sales and profit are two of the options. There are three more options to consider. We'll start with sales. Now, obviously, the first thing that you'd be thinking uh, for price is market share. There is the assumption that if we decrease the price, we should increase the market share. Not always strictly true. You can increase the price and increase the market share if the value of what you are offering is worth the new price tag you are presenting. But we'll take for the moment an objective of sales. A sales objective is sell more units, make more money. The profit objective is a good objective. The word profit has had its problems over the years, and one of the things as a marketer you'll kind of find difficult is actually profiteering. It's not as easy to do as you would like it to be. But if you think of profit as the corporate survival, you are solving a problem, you need to continue having the revenue to keep the company operating so that problem can continue to be solved, then profit is okay. You are basically also though in pricing, sales can be non-financial pricing. You want to increase market share so you make it less complex. You want to increase market share so you make it quicker or slower. You make it more risk so that more adventurers want to go, or you make it less risky, so more of the conservative market wants to go. Profit in non-financial is kind of harder to do, and we won't touch on it here, but it does come in a little bit later. Usually touch on that. Now what's the first two objectives, sales and profit, can be used in the plan? And should be used in the plan, you should be thinking, why am I having this plan? My plan is I want growth, therefore I need sales. Or I want ongoing survival, therefore I need profit. There are three other pricing objectives available to you that are a lot of fun. And let's be absolutely honest here, this is going to be fun. Objective number one, the defense or offense strategy Pricing as a means to fight a rival organization. You can price match, you can price mirror, you can price undercuts. If you've got a big enough budget, you can basically burn the other company to the ground and then swoop through and take out their market because you're the only one standing. Generally speaking, it's a really dumb idea to try that, but that hasn't stopped a wide range of companies. And sometimes they succeed. But all they establish is that they lower the average referent price for their particular product in that market and it steadily decreases the value of the market. You burn it hard enough, often enough, and you find yourself the proud owner of a mostly useless market that doesn't want to pay a lot of money but demands quite high quality. But defensively, the competitive effects, you can match, so you can do price matching. You can copy. There's nothing to stop you from replicating the price tag on an opponent's product. There's no patent, registered design, or legal protection of price. But there's one other thing you can do with price, and that is you can make your opponent's product look cheap, look shoddy. You can come in on a higher price point with a better value offer or an equivalent value offer that is perceived to be higher quality because you're more expensive. Cafes, nightclubs and alcohol drinks do this on a regular basis. 
It cost me five dollars here, it cost me ten dollars here, this ten dollar drink must be better. After all, I'm a savvy consumer, I wouldn't get ripped off for a price, call for a price trick like that. Outprice your opponent by going above them. Increase the value of them, make it more financially viable for you to fight in their turf by charging more and taking their premium customers, customers away. All right, the second price objective is customer satisfaction. This is long-term loyalty. This is discounting for having been involved in the firm for a while, having bought from us on a regular basis. One of the things on pricing deal, a pricing bundle, that's very important, is that if you offer a new product price bundle, so new customers get a price bundle of a product a discounted price and a bunch of features, your existing customers need to have some reward for being existing customers rather than feeling that they've been penalised for loyalty. One of the things that took place in the early days of the telecommunications, uh, the change in the telecommunications markets that saw Optus come in as a new competitor to the then Telecom, who became Telstra, is loyal Telstra customers got nothing but bills. If you were a cutthroat trader and you kept and you jumped to Optus, Optus would offer you a discount. As soon as you crossed wires and were uh, in Optus's hands, Telstra would come back and counter offer with a better discount. Jump back again, Optus would come back with a third offer, Telstra would probably bring you back on a fourth offer. By the time you had shown yourself to be an untrustworthy, despicable rogue of a, co a consumer whose loyalty could be bought for the lowest bid, you were getting a better deal than the loyal customers. By and large, that's usually a bad sign. If the loyal customer who buys repeatedly from you is getting screwed out of their uh, value offer, because you are neglecting them in favour of trying to steal other customers or newcomers, you're doing it wrong. This is also one of the problems in the pricing strategy and political marketing at the moment, is the emphasis in politics has been on the swinging voter rather than the loyal voter, and rather than building up loyal bases, trying to bring across increasingly large swathes of either the opposition's your opponents uh, vote. And if you start doing this in business, what you run into is you run into this problem that loyalty is seen as a cost to the firm, by loyalty to the firm is seen as a cost by the consumer. And you don't want the consumer looking for any opportunity to leave or leave as frequently as possible. The third pricing objective is quite heavily linked to promotion very strongly influences brand and is an integral part of the information and value components this evening. So what happens here in image enhancement is that the price is used as a proxy measure of the quality. But it also is deliberately used to communicate what sort of market you want, who it is, how much money it's going to cost them to pay. And if you've ever played poker, price in poker is a communications tool. If somebody goes and raises the bid by a significant amount, so single blind 25, double blind 50, and 50, 50 to play, somebody puts in, in 500, you can be pretty much assured that they're confident in their hand, bluffing, but they're signaling, they're using the, it's going to cost you 500 to come up against me, are uh, you up for it? It is a challenge, it's an aggressive move. Here, image enhancement, a price can say a lot about a product. And it's an unknown brand, no one knows anything about it, no one's heard of it before, it comes out with a price that is up in the luxury. I have no idea who this brand is, but wow, you're it's a bottle of water and you're charging 
$7.50 for 600 mils. Either that's the biggest damn draw in history, or that stuff's got to be good. And the image enhancement trick is you present a product that perceives to be high quality. You use the advertising messages and cues to tell people it's high quality. Then you chuck a decent price tag on it and you put it up in the upper limits and people go, yep, that's consistent, it's expensive, it looks good, got some classy advertising happening there, this thing, got to be worth the money. It's got to be good because it's expensive, it's got to be valuable because it costs a lot. So communicating a message saying, this is what my price costs, this is important. The other thing in terms of pricing and communication of a message is cheap and what you think is expensive are relative terms. From personal business experience, a product that I could manufacture, it was a CD based uh, software event, it will cost a grandiose total of per unit 100, sorry, per unit it came down to 15 bucks per thousand units. We've run a thousand units, so it costs us 15 bucks a unit to run. We were selling them at what we thought was the exorbitant market rate of $150 per unit. We left a zero off the end. It wasn't valued by our customers because it was so cheap, it couldn't be any good. Whereas for $1,500, $1,500 per unit of a unit, a market was going to cost us 15 bucks to make. Calculate your profit there. They would have sat up and said, this thing's got to be good. We were in a business to business market, we were dealing with luxury products, we were dealing with people who were charging for corporate boxes, we were charging $30,000 for a single hire of a venue once. For one event for two hours, 30k. We were not anywhere near the right price and our image suffered as a result. So the pricing objectives, you can actually get, you set the wrong price and it can harm your brand and your image and your reputation. So when you are putting your marketing plan together, think in terms of, okay, I want to make some sales, I want to make some profits, what can I do to my opponents, how can I shift the market around, how can I change the game, am I rewarding those who have stayed with me, am I punishing those who have stayed with me, do I want to do that? And what is the price tag communicating about my product? So, let's talk about things that you would do and you would write down. Basically, what's the game plan? The game plan is you want to make some money, maximise the return. This is about profit. This is about... But this is also tied to distinct parts of the product lifecycle. When you first introduce a product to the market, you charge a premium. Quite often you charge a premium because you've spent a lot of money to get that product to the market and you want to get some of that money back. But at the same time, you also want to sell a really high price, open price, so that as the product matures, when you drop the cost of production and you drop the, uh, the price of purchase, your profit margin is still there. The second object is the recovery costs. This quite often is done in non-profit services or on um, defensive products where really it's about making certain that the product pays its way but you're not too fussed about it's not going to be made in come straight. This is selling printers where the cost of the plastic is exceed, does not exceed the price tag you put on the box when we know that the money is going to come from the ink. You're going to make a premium on the printer ink, but you're going to charge, you know, you're going to try and break even on the printer. Now, this was the thing in the Sony, PlayStation, the Microsoft Xbox, and the Xbox 360, and the Nintendo. Microsoft and Sony were 
rumoured to sell their units at a co at cost or below cost. They were willing to lose money per unit because they planned on making out the money on the video games and the things that you used in the units. Whereas Nintendo apparently just said, well that sounds like a really wasted opportunity. Why don't we make a profit on the console and the games? Which is why when Nintendo was one of the top selling video game consoles for a while there, they were doing considerably better business than when their opponents were actually number one top selling unit because their opponents were losing money per unit sold. However, that can be an objective in and of itself, that you are trying to max out the number of possible users. Take, if you will, the whole casual gaming markets, the iPhone and Android application markets, where you give out a free product. Because you want to max out the number of people who are using your product, because you are either going to be selling advertising on it, poor choice, or you're going to sell additional features, but you need a platform. You can't sell the extra 99 cent move set or the extra bonus features if no one's using the original object. So you make a loss on the original object in return for having a platform that is yours to play with. Fourth on your objective list is social equity. This is where you have differential pricing based on a set of people in a market who you want to address. You want to have people accessing this product. So this is the discount price for students. This is the free newspapers for students because you guys are seen as people who may not necessarily be able to afford the finance and afford the money, but the firm regards it as important for you to have access to this information. This is the discounted welfares for pensioners. This is the stuff where one group pays less for the same service as another group, and the, other, the second group cross funds the first. It's really neat, as a whole basis of awesome things taking place, so consider it. Final one is demarketing, and this is a fascinating one. This is where your price objective is to reduce the number of customers that you have. And it feels counterintuitive. If, however, you have exceeded the production capacity, you have more orders than you are capable of delivering. You are either a small business or maybe you are a seasonal dependent business or you have certain finite resources. There are only 30 spaces, 30 seats on a particular bus. You need a demarketing strategy that charges higher for the high peak demand period so that people who don't necessarily need to use that are moved to other areas where your network has capacity. So demarketing can be used to move people from one time to another. It's very common in services marketing. There's the whole two for Tuesday, cheap Tuesdays approach, which is basically, um, it's the inverse that's encouraging people, but you can quite easily look at a Friday night premium, and many places do have, if you want, if you look at flights, uh, popular flight times are uh, charged at a higher rate for holiday seasons, so that the people who don't need to be travelling on the network are removed from the network. Demarketing is also really fun because it's where you turn around and say, I don't want you as a customer anymore, I'm going to push you out, I'm going to outprice you, I'm going to get rid of you because my brand is different, it's repositioned, I want to sell less units at a higher cost to a small number of people. Alright, things that you're not going to have to write up in the um, marketing plan, but we do have to mention the price is estimating demand. We need to from economics, so pop over there, steal their uh, lunch, and look at the theory from there. What you need to be thinking is what 
impact will changing the price of my product have on the way on the number of consumers I have? If I raise my price, will my number of consumers go up? Will they stay the same or will they go down? And I keep mentioning that as you raise price, you can increase the number of consumers you have. If in raising the price, so you move something from a cost of $35 to 100 incrementally, to $150, you may find yourself selling t-shirts that you were originally selling in a market at $35 ago, you are now selling them in a little boutique store for $150 ago and you're selling more of them because they are perceived, the cost of the shirt is part of the value of the shirt. It's the, I'm wearing this brand, this brand is expensive, look at me. And you raise the price and you increase your customers. If we were rational, and as a species we're not, I don't care what they say, price the power of If the price goes up, in theory everything's supposed to go down. In practice, quite often it doesn't. Same way, if the price goes down, sometimes so does the number of customers. You drop the price and it's like you, no longer exclusive. Or you lower, you lower the price and people are like, yeah, I don't think this is, I'm not getting value anymore. Because one of the reasons I was buying this product was to say, hey, I'm richer than that. So, yeah, watch for it. Here, the thinking is what counts, not necessarily reporting it. This bit, not going to be featuring. You don't have to run these calculations and report them in. You don't have to report these in the market plan. Feel free to run the calculations. Feel free to think this through, calculate this stuff. But I'm not looking for it. I'm not looking for a budget, I'm not looking for an expenditure list, and I'm not looking for a bunch of calculations. I'm looking for you to use the words, because that's what we do well here. And you got that training using the numbers and the other subjects. Alright, similarly, the things you're looking at here, things like the price of elasticity, you are wanting to be conversant with the ideas so that when you are making decisions to raise or lower a price, what will that do to your demand, and is it what you want it to do to your demand? If you want to absolutely cut down the demand, your services are horribly overstretched, your staff are tired out, you're just not making the quality you were in previously, you might want to just ramp it up in production price, hope that your demand is elastic and you change the prices and wax the demand on the head. Of course, if it turns out it's an elastic demand, you've got other problems, you've got to fix that yourself. But again, will the change impact on the demand? If so, will it be the impact you want? Alright, and the costs. I want you to think about this. This is under the rule that the marketing plan operates under for budgets is be reasonable. Be sensible. But I'm not looking for a budget breakdown. So basically if you can if you consider it and keep it in mind. So if you go off and say that you're doing a product, you're making a you're selling small handmade confectionery, exotic handmade confectionery of custom flavours, so people could request a mint, rosemary, and lamb flavoured uh, lolly. And basically, for the costs elements that you know that you've got all the various uh, components of the thing, you don't have to give me a breakdown of how much it would cost, what would happen, and how it will work out. It could, but if you're a small one person business and like making these custom weird flavored sweets, and you tell me that you're going to have a multi million dollar advertising budget, I'm going to tell you that you are wrong, and I'm going to laugh and take your marks off you. So if you're a one-person show, budget accordingly. If you're a big, major, multinational conglomerate, throw a little money around. Make it happen. So if you are pretending to be Coca-Cola, 
you got some grunt, you got some firepower, use it. If you're pretending to be Apple, likewise. If you're pretending to be a little corner store down the Civic, budget accordingly. Be smart about it. Think it through, put it in your notes, work out what... However, work out when you're dealing with the costs that you are going to incur, what's that set your base price at? So you've got something to start thinking about, yeah, where to from here for the psychological pricing. Alright, things that you need to do to set up the pricing environment, things you need to go through, these are your notes. Aloha, you will recognize a section of the marketing plan that has been here previously. And that, by the time you get to the point of talking about pricing and marketing mix, you have covered the pest. You've looked at the political and the economic. There upon the screen is the impact on the pricing environment. What's the economy look like? What's the real economy look like? Not the economy as described to you by a bunch of people who have a vested interest in you thinking the economy is a bad place. Economic growth, is it there? What's the consumer confidence like? How much money is hanging about in the marketplace? How much money is tied up and hard to get to? How much money is freely available? What are you up against in terms of competition? You might recognise this as well because there's a section where you talk about competitors. How big's the market? What's the structure like? Who's got the grunt? Who's the A-game player that everyone's trying to beat? Who's got the market power to change prices? Who's got the market power to change costs? And there's a neat devil in the detail trick you can do is buy up the supply lines of your opponents. You gotta be beat to do this. You gotta have some cash behind you. But if you wanted to absolutely shoot Apple down, find the key core critical ingredients in their product and then outbid them on that raw ingredient. Capacitive touch screens, maybe, plastic cases or silicon lines, something in there has to be vulnerable to you buying up the stock of it. And if the competition's carefully structured and the market's kind of tight, you can pull that move off. Finally, on this, we're back on CB, but we also see a segmentation group. What influences the pricing? Lifestyles and demography. What you think is good value as a student versus what is good value as a career professional versus what was good value for you 10 years ago. All these things change. Life stages. A premium bottle of good quality wine suddenly becomes really important when you're only going to be having time to have two glasses of it a week versus I wish to be unconscious on, Friday, on Saturday morning through Sunday evening, what maxes out that capacity to do that on a Friday night? What's cheap and hardcore? So look at your trends, but also look at this element in terms of where have your notes covered it previously? Lifestyles and demographics were in your segmentation variables. So they are notes that you have talked about, thought about when you're talking about consumer, thinking about consumer. Competition is covered both in your, head, in your analysis of the external environments and in your write-up about competitors. The economy shows up in pest. This is a cyclical process. Marketing is interconnected. Max out your capacity to see where the wires cross over and make use of them. Alright, so those are your options on your price and strategy choices. What it's worth plus a percentage what the competitor is charging for it, how much demand there is, if there's a premium demand, charge a premium price, how much you need to make, how bad someone wants it, and whether it's a new product or not. All right, let's talk at these through. Price based on costs. Cost based pricing is easy. Work out how much it costs, whack a percentage sign on top of it, so it costs you, uh, it's cost, it's N plus 20% or N plus 25%. Real low risk, but uh, you know what? No, that was great. 
The pro is you'll cover your costs. The cons are you will just cover your costs. There's not a lot of room for profit here. There's no sense to the demand. It doesn't talk to the brand image. You don't think about it in terms of linkage to other aspects. You just ran an Excel spreadsheet on it. You're also not maxing out your opportunity to use Christ as a full power toolkit. Now, price based on demand, you start, you start doing calculations. This is pretty good actually, for a market's point of view, because demand based pricing lets you do some demarketing, where you can discourage people from going in high peak periods where you don't have capacity to serve their needs, where you can max out revenue. You can say, someone who needs to buy a ticket to get on this plane in the next hour before it leaves needs to leave in a hurry. They're not going to be price sensitive. We can charge them a lot. Versus the hotel approach of, wow, empty room is a wasted room. How do we get someone through the door? That's not the price of it. They guarantee that they'll come in here and be a warm body in the room. We'll let them have a luxury hotel room for the wash it, super secret special, $99. So there are different ways of doing it, there are different ways, but again, price capacity and demand is good because you're starting to be able to look at the consumer as an active player in setting the price. How bad do they want you to can determine how much it's worth to them, which helps you to determine the price. Price based on competition, look, I talk about this as a really bad idea by and large, because it's usually a really bad idea. You are delegating one of the most critical elements of your profit-making processes to somebody else. You're handing it over control. You're letting it go. It's, it's the best of what's bad idea. On the other hand, you can make it a good idea if you use price as a signal. If you use these other elements in terms of demand and in terms of, say, cost, you work out, look, it costs us $25, parts, labour and equipment included. What do the other guys charge? The other guys charge 75 bucks. All right, it's worth us charging 75 bucks. We're making 50 bucks on it. We're parity, we're comparable, people think that we're equal quality, it's worth, it's worth doing that. It's also worth observing a competitor's price so that you can think about your positioning. If you're going to come in, you don't want to set your price based on what they're doing, but you want to let your pricing decision, compared to what they're doing, and your opponent's doing with their price, you want to make certain that it is a conscious and deliberate act. If you are going to price above your opponent, you need to position that you are the better quality brand. That you're better than that cheaper option. If you're going to match, then you are going to be saying we are equivalent worth or we are worth more than our opponent at the same price. We try harder, we give you more. If you're going to go below your opponents, then what you are doing is you position yourself as the cheaper alternative, the me too. The, so your first option's not there, why not us? Why not Zoomberg? How do you position? This is also come back to in branding and in advertising and communication, Knowing where your price fits against your opponents lets you set up to deliver the message. How do you fit against the other people? How do you fit into the reference pricing? Don't let them set your price. Use their price to inform what you're doing. Alright, the customer needs are uh, pricing. Look for the marketing plan because it's your first run through and it's a short term thing, you're probably not going to need to work with this. Uh, this is where you look at it in terms of long term customer retention, so you know, discount for buying in bulk, or an upfront, we will give you an initial 
heavily discounted price for a trial purchase because if you become a regular purchaser from us at our base rate, we will have a long-term ongoing relationship that becomes increasingly beneficial to both of us. But mostly you're not doing this in this marketing plan because it's, that's an advanced move and this is a basic subject. All right, new product pricing. I talked about this briefly before, but it comes down to two things. Really high, very expensive, premium for first movers. Ties back to innovation adoption theory, ties back to consumer behavior, ties back, the innovator pays the premium to be first, and they want to pay that premium. You are doing the right thing by them by taking their money off them. Alternatively, the other way around is you're going for penetration pricing where you sweep into a market at a discounted rate because you have a product that needs to be experienced. People need to try it. The two weeks free, the opening offer, the limited time only, people have to try it for it to work. Either of these are acceptable approaches. But they are absolutely polar, they're polar extremes to each other. So what you need to do is you need to explain to me which one you're going to use and why it's valuable and why it's a deliberate decision for you to go penetration versus skimming. Because you can't do both. Alright, another issue for you to consider for the marketing plan, the distribution based pricing. Welcome to the linkage by the way, between price and place. How your product reaches the end user will influence both its perception of value, the, the costs actually incurred in the value, and particularly this day and age of internet marketing, the perceived worth. If you've gone onto eBay at any point in time and looked for a wide range of products, and sorted by price plus postage first, you would have found a whole series of products, quite often in the electronics area, where it's a buy it now price of a dollar, and it's a shipping cost of $199. Because basically, the person is trying to get you to go, ooh, this is ludicrously cheap, I'll pay my dollar for it, oh wait, that's $200. Yeah. That's it, I don't have to come on for it, John, don't. No, don't. However, if you have ever gone through Amazon, ThinkGeek, or any other online retailer, loaded up the cart full of things you want to buy, and then hit checkout only to see that the international shipping was going to cost you more than the product itself, particularly bad at t-shirt sites. Online t-shirt vendors are shoppers for this, where the t-shirt itself is 10 bucks and the shipping is $75. The value of the product, 10 bucks for a shirt with a catchy, snappy slogan on it, a steal. 85 bucks for that shirt, a ripoff. So you need to be watching what influenced the total price, the total cost of your product to your end user in terms of shipping cost plus purchase cost plus usage cost. So keep these in mind, look at these as options. Look at how they can work. Because the other thing on this to remember is that we're also needing the non-financial price. What is the non-financial price aspect of distribution? How long is seven days? 28 days? How long is four to six weeks? in terms of, is someone willing to pay a premium for fast? Is fast, therefore, the distribution options worth more? Immediacy worth more than delay? Is the saving, is the product something that would be urgent and need to be shipped quickly, in which case you can charge a premium on your distribution, or is the product and then the distribution will be seen as quality because it's a premium charge? So look at these, consider these as options. All right, and the final aspect, I'll remind you again. All the way through, in pricing, all of the key elements 
need to be mapped against your target market. Now you are in intro, I'm not expecting you to have massive details into your target market, massive insight into the consumer. But you need to be thinking in terms of what's the offer I'm making? What, how valuable is it? Is it an offer that will be valued at the price I am charging you assets? So have that in mind, give that a thought. And that is the pre-record.